Welcome to the Veritas Forum, engaging university students and faculty in discussions about life's hardest questions and the relevance of Jesus Christ to all of life. Well, my friends, I just want to say, first of all, thanks for coming. Thanks to the organizers for taking care of us, to the Veritas Forum, all the students uh, behind the scenes who had to do tons of work. I'm really excited to share the stage here with Professor Karp. He's uh, both a colleague of mine and a good friend that I've known for years. And I've uh, just admired his friendship, and I'm excited to just be doing this. You know, the thing about college that makes it great, that I want to encourage you guys for, is that this is the one time in your life that you can ask and struggle with big questions. You can just sit back, go to your dorm, have some pizza, and ask big questions with other people like yourselves. And you, know, you could think about questions like, what is the meaning of life? How do you measure what is real? Is there a God? And why are infinity scarves so popular? <laughs> Isn't it just a scarf with the ends connected? So today we're here to talk about big ideas. You know, God, math, reality. Three awesome things. You know, but each one of us have our own perspective on what reality is. You know, whose perspective on reality is right? Well, you know, there's math reality. This is the Gauss-Bonnet theorem, one of the sexiest theorems ever made. Let me explain to you what it is right here. It says the integral of the curvature, which means you're just adding up the curvature at every point on some manifold at the surface. It's just 2 pi times the Euler characteristic, which means no matter how you stretch this surface up, although the little curvatures are changing all the time, when you add it up, it has to be a fixed constant. Stunning. Now, a few of you I know are getting turned on by this theorem. <laughs> But most of you probably agree with Stephen Colbert when he says that the equations are the devil's sentences. <laughs> and so there's this notion of what mathematical reality is. You know, there's also a notion of what physical reality is. Like what is physically real? This is uh, from Stephen Hawking's recent book. He says, the universe does not have a single existence or history, but rather every possible version of the universe exists simultaneously. He's talking about a notion of the multiverse. Is this real? I mean, is the multiverse happening, or is that just a theory? Where's the line between these things? You know, for thousands of years, the notions of truth and reality have been linked to a notion of God. But today in the 21st century, especially in America today, we feel that reality is no longer measured by a language of God or church or holy days. We believe that religion is no longer relevant to us. Today, we, we think of it something like a scaffolding, just to hold things in place while science comes and fills up the details. Now, this is best explained by this uh, saying by Michio Kaku, who's quoting and rephrasing Arthur C. Clarke's work. He says, any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from divinity. Basically, if you think you don't get it now, just wait. It'll all make sense later on. Science will clear it up. Science has become the new all-encompassing measure of reality. Black is the new white. Science is the new God. So how do we get this way? Now, let me step back a bit. You know, the Renaissance was a time when art and music and literature and math all worked together. We had faith and reason and beauty and science were intertwined. And this resulted in amazing paintings, poems, cathedrals, inventions. Now, followed the Renaissance was the time of the Enlightenment, around 1750. And here, science and reason were advocated as the primary source of authority. Ideas must be tested, measured, evaluated. Look, you just can't tell me that the sun is in the center of our solar system. You must measure it. You must test it, evaluate it, prove it. My friends, I'm a huge fan of the Enlightenment era. I love it. It's a major force for progress, for understanding how the world works. It's given us better cars, better medicine, better ice cream. I love these things. But to me, in the 21st century, unfortunately, it's been taken to an extreme. You see, now we try to explain everything through science alone. This is Bertrand Russell's quote, famous mathematician and philosopher. He says, whatever knowledge is attainable must be attained by scientific methods. And what science cannot discover mankind cannot know. 
See, we're putting all our chips in the science bucket. Well, one major consequence of this is this notion called dualism. Let me just give you a background here. Here's the Renaissance viewpoint, right? Art and math fit together. Faith and reason fit together. Religion and politics, supernatural and natural. Let me just explain religion and politics. Religion is the way you answer the big questions in life. Right? Everybody has an answer to this somehow. And politics is how you handle day-to-day -day things. So of course, the way you think about the big questions is going to impact your day-to-day -day things. They are fitting together. But when the Enlightenment comes in, the en Enlightenment doesn't say you have to pick one. What it actually does is you have to pick and forces it to be against one another. And on one side, you have the sensitive, kind art major, <laughs> loving and pure. The other side, this cold-hearted, calculating punk of a math major. <laughs> but somehow sexy in their own way, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> well, what I want to do is to not sterilize the world. I don't want to cut the world into pieces. I'm not saying you have to pick one bucket or the other one. I want to deal with things in the middle, the messy things. I love messy things. Let me give you an example of a few messy things I love. Here's one, ice cream. This is ice cream from a place called A La Minute, which I just had last night for the first time in my life. It's an hour east of here. They make ice cream using liquid nitrogen. They make it when you order it fresh. Unbelievable. The chocolate lavender is in a different world. Here's something else I love that is messy. Sex. Women, relationships, dating. This is messy stuff. This is what life is about. How do you handle something like this thing? For me, it's this messiness of life. And for us to say, you know what? That's just an evolutionary process that happens. Check the box. It's more than that, my friends. Do you know that when you actually eat food nowadays, we're really not eating food. Most of us are eating nutrition labels. You know, this is what the Enlightenment has done. It's ripped things into pieces. Here's something else that I love that's totally messy. This is a picture of my family. Right? Yeah, sounds great. So you roll up your sleeves. Let me explain a couple of things here, right? <laughs> so first of all, if you notice, my wife is not Indian. Yes. She will be one of the first to tell you that marriage is hard as it is. But one of the things that makes it harder is if you marry somebody outside your race because it's hard to understand what their background is. Even if you grew up in the same hometown, somebody might say, you know what, Thanksgiving is the most important thing in my family. No, 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 it's Christmas, that's the most important thing. And there's tension already, much less you bring in people from different cultures. It is a messy thing, and if you think that's messy, you have these two things on the right and that one on the left, right? Their lives are messed up, right? Us as parents, what's their identity like? What's that gonna be? Then you have that other little one. This is a zoom in picture of her. This is my baby girl. Uh, we adopted her uh, a couple of years ago. We've had her since the day she was born. But can you imagine her life as she grows older? Can you imagine the mess that she has to go through? This Indian dad, this Chinese mom, random kids all around. <laughs> but my friends, I wouldn't trade any of this because this is what makes life fantastic, this messiness. It's not the cleanliness that science offers all the time. You see, what I want is a model. I want a theory. I want a story, whatever way you want to call it, that can handle this beautiful mess. You see, I am ambitious. I want a model of everything. I want a framework to understand everything in this world, not just the things of science. I want to understand everything. You see, all of us long for bigger things. We long for justice. We long for beauty, for experiences, for significance. Do you know why Victoria's Secret doesn't sell clothes using data? Because they have sexy, naked women. That's how you sell clothes. We love physical things. Why do we go to concerts and watch sports? Because we have the shared experience. It's bigger than us. Why do we listen to Oprah, Deepak Chopra? Why do we care about music and mysticism? Because we thirst for meaning in something bigger. We're looking for this. Why do our hearts burn when we watch 12 Years a Slave? or when we watch The Godfather because we thirst for justice and retribution. We want these bigger things. You see, we have a big, messy world, and we're dealing with issues 
that are too large in complexity, way more complex than things like dark matter, or genetics, or gauss bonnet too big for science to handle. You see, throughout history, there are people who have thought about these things, these big things. They're the writers, the musicians, the artists, the philosophers, the theologians. They have tried to capture the immensity and complexity of life. Well, everyone has a story, a theory to explain the mess of this world. You know, to an atheist, it could be the messiness has come from evolution. Maybe it's as simple answer as that. Maybe an agnostic will say, you know, we'll never know where the messiness comes from and, the, and what we have to do is do the best we have so far. You know, Plato had an answer to where the mess came from. He said the mess was matter, physical thing. This is the mess. The ideas were the pure things. And this body, this crude thing, that's what's giving us the problems in this world. Marx had, a pro had an answer to this. The messiness comes from economics, socio-economical issues. Freud had an answer. He said the messiness is because of your parents. You see, to the Christian faith, it says that all of these are true. Your parents are to blame. But the core issue, the deep core issue, is that there's a separation from us and God. That's the reason for this messiness. You see, to me, there is no story as satisfying, no theory as strong in explaining the world, all of the world, better than the Christian faith. And I see no tension between the Christian faith and the claims of science. You see, math and science are tools for us to measure, to understand, to study patterns and find structures in this world. Same God is alive in both of them. And unlike any theory I know of, this faith boldly says that this world and its mess is built into the very heart of God himself. This is seen to me in no greater clarity than in the life and the death of Jesus, his death on the cross, which I believe is the climax of history where evil was defeated. In this death, we see God actually sharing responsibility for our mess. It's my role. And the resurrection of Jesus, it's not some spiritual ghost who came back from the dead, but in a physical flesh and body resurrection, says that this world matters. Flesh matters, ice cream matters, sex matters, earth matters. Moreover, it says God's new world has already broken in here and now, bringing in the power for justice, equality, and the cancellation of debts. And this story that I believe in, this model, this theory, it's not theoretical alone, it's not philosophical, it's not just metaphysical, it's grounded in the mess of history. And it makes incredible historical claims about the resurrection of Christ in particular. And we cannot use the tools of science to talk about this, but we can bear on it the weapons of history to see if it holds. And I'm convinced they do. Finally, I've tested this in my own life and seen it in the lives of others around me. When I submit to this story, I see more forgiveness and peace and contentment and a wisdom to live life well in my own life. So let me just close with a, a quote from one of my favorite movies and books, Princess Bride. Life is pain. Anyone that says different is selling something. See, there are no easy answers. There's no like 15 minute speech I can say that's gonna open any eyes. I'm encouraging you to wrestle with big questions. Don't be afraid to get messy. Thank you for your time. What's up, everyone? It's good to see you. It's a real honor to be here. Uh, so thanks so much for everyone at Veritas for inviting me. It's a real honor to share the stage with Safian, who's somebody uh, who's a great friend and somebody who I really admire. In fact, uh, our mathematics isn't so different. We think about similar topics. And as much as we disagree about things like God, if you really want to see the sparks fly, ask us to talk about pentagons versus hexagons. Five or six-sided figures, this is really where we get to disagree. Sorry, but the permutahedron is just too cool, my friend. OK, so I want to start thinking about the question, how do I understand reality? How do I understand this universe around us? Well, sorry, folks, but this is mud, and I'm a mathematician. So we have to do some proving. <laughs> I want to start this discussion with a little proof. And I think it'll illustrate how I think about the nature of reality. 
So let's prove together, shall we, that the square root of 2 is irrational. All right, let's prove it. So what does it mean? Well, first of all, irrational means not rational. And rational means fraction. So all this is saying is that the square root of 2 cannot be written as a fraction. So how in the world would we ever prove such a statement? Well, the idea is something like this. Let's suppose that you could write the square root of 2 as a fraction and see if something goes horribly, terribly wrong. And if it does, we'll know that that was a really bad thing to suppose. All right. So once we suppose otherwise, the proof is almost done. This is really the big idea. If the square root of 2 is equal to a fraction, so the square root of 2 is some a over b, of course fractions are reduced. a and b are not both even, right? 2 fourths is the same thing as 1 half. We're cool here. Then the proof is almost done. Because if the square root of 2 is equal to a over b, then a squared is equal to 2b squared. So all of a sudden I learn that a squared must be an even number. And here's the really cool part. 2 is a prime number. Magical things. I can't take any other two numbers, multiply them together to get 2. Which means if there's a 2 inside of a squared, there must have been a 2 inside of a to begin with. So that means that not only is a squared even, but a itself is even. OK, so if a has a 2 in it, that means that a squared has a 4 in it, which means that 4 divides 2b squared, which means that 2 divides b squared. And we have the same argument again, that b itself must be even. So we assume that a and b are not both even. And we are necessarily led to the conclusion that, in fact, both a and b are even. OK, that's a problem. So Zeus strikes us down with a lightning bolt. Contradiction. Our hypothesis was incorrect. The square root of 2 is irrational. OK, good job, folks. A little analysis in the evening. OK, so why am I bringing this stuff up? I think it actually illustrates a lot about how I think about the nature of the universe. In particular, I have some foundational belief that the universe is not ridiculous. 2 is prime or 2 is not prime. A and B are both even or A and B are not both even. That much is a foundational belief. And I don't know what it would mean to suppose otherwise. I don't, I don't know what that would mean about our universe if both of these things could simultaneously be true. It certainly wouldn't agree with uh, like anything physical, right? I mean, all the physical phenomena that are based on mathematics would all be incorrect somehow. Um, doesn't seem to be the case. OK, so uh, how does that relate to things like religion and God? Well, this says to me that God exists or doesn't. I'm really cool either way. I just can't have both of them. God exists, God doesn't exist. I'm, I'm, I'm cool either way. So. Uh, we could entertain, as we are, ideas surrounding Christianity and the Christian faith. And there are such beautiful ideas surrounding Christianity. Satyan was mentioning Jesus Christ. It's, I, I cannot, I'm certainly not uh, the right person to ask, but I could not begin to describe the subtle and beautiful ideas surrounding Jesus Christ, ideas of faith and humility, service to the poor, forgiveness, I think it's a, a, a very beautiful thing to consider. And when I consider Jesus Christ or the Christian faith in isolation, in isolation I think there's really beautiful and persuasive ideas. Uh, and if I were only considering this possibility, I find many of the ideas very convincing, very beautiful. But uh, I'm not only considering this faith. There seem to be many other ideas, philosophies, many other world religions to consider. For instance, uh, you know, in high school I learned about the Greek myths. Those were the Greek gods, right? There are beautiful ideas and beautiful culture built on top of those religions. Maybe there is a very beautiful merman with a trident and a wicked beard at the bottom of the ocean. I also find that persuasive. The sun god Ra, these are beautiful ideas, whole cultures and civilizations. Our society wouldn't be what it is if these folks back a long time ago wouldn't have been persuaded by beautiful ideas and moral lessons they learned from other religious practices. I find them all beautiful. I don't know which ones exist or which don't. As far as I can tell, 
my perspective seems to be that religions were kind of created precisely to be things that we could neither approve nor disprove. So I don't know whether they're not true or not. I could certainly not argue, but there's lots of beautiful ideas there in this myriad of different uh, faiths and religions. So that leaves something of a decision to be made, right? Like, where do we go from there? I, I would say that we have some tools and some responsibilities. So here's some perspective. <laughs> something that locals will know and love. The mission of Harvey Mudd College. And this includes very specifically thinking about the impact of our work on society. And I would say that not only includes our work in mathematics, I think that mathematicians should not sit in a shoebox of their own creation and think about math in isolation from the rest of the world. They should think about the impact of their work on society. And if we have religious persuasions, we should also think about the impact of those on society. This is something that can help guide us in all aspects of our life. And there are amazing impacts of individuals that are Christians. Mind-boggling. MLK, Mother Teresa, the list is endless. Amazing contributions to society that I'm unqualified to even begin to describe. But there have been negative consequences as well. Things like the Inquisition, genocide, slavery. These are not separate from religious practice. In fact, Christianity was very important for the slave practice. It was necessary for the moral justifications of white Europeans when enslaving peoples of Africa to say, we are not enslaving other peoples. Those are mere heathens that believe in heathen gods. They're not sufficiently sophisticated. They don't have our religious beliefs. So it's okay to go about doing this kind of horrible stuff. And that is not a condemnation of all things Christian, but it is, an, I think, something that we should be aware of. We have to look at the impact of our work. And if we believe something, then we have to be careful about how it's implemented. We have to be careful about how it's implemented. So Satyan was discussing the notion of the Enlightenment. And I think it's interesting to consider not only the historical impacts of Christianity, but the contemporary American impacts of Christianity. And my political beliefs are that some of the most dangerous and destructive political movements in the country are from the Christian right. That's just my personal political beliefs. So from my perspective, it doesn't seem like we're in a time when there's too much science. We're at a time when states are having legal battles over creationism, when people are denying the overwhelming evidence for human involvement in global warming. This isn't a time of too much science. It's a time of too little. There was a time when America had a lot of religious Puritans, and it wasn't a place of great scientific research. Then Sputnik happened. Government put a lot of money into science. Then we had great scientific research. Now things seem to me to be going in the other direction. This doesn't feel like a period of enlightenment to me. It feels like a period of unenlightenment. It feels like we're devolving. We're, this is de-evolution. That's Devo, by the way, guys. We're, we're, we're devolving here. Uh, so I think that now more than ever, we need to argue for the importance of science uh, in our lives, in our society, and as Satyan said, in relationship to our politics and our public lives. So, how do I think about a moral compass? Uh, given this situation, given that I feel the need for increased attention to science, and given that I'm not really sure which of any of all these religious faiths might be accurate, how do I decide you know, what to do, what's right and wrong? I think there's a lot of great ideas out there. Uh, for instance, Lao Tzu wrote long before the birth of Christ that we don't need to envision a god uh, that's born to a virgin mother uh, to have ideas of correct moral attitudes. We could learn moral lessons from the natural world. We could take our moral cues from water, which is a very beautiful and subtle idea. Spill a glass of water, it naturally runs to the dirtiest places and helps them be clean. It dwells in the lowliest places. These are lessons for us from the natural world that I find persuasive. Uh, maybe some lessons from religious leaders. I neither need to believe in reincarnation nor karma nor the existence of nirvana to think about uh, 
statements like this that I find so persuasive. This is from the Dalai Lama. And this is, I think, very connected with Satyan's last slide. All of us suffer. It seems that that's something extremely universal. We suffer. And isn't it a beautiful idea and a simple idea to say, should we not work to reduce the suffering of ourselves and those around us? It requires no belief in anything larger, only the idea that if I suffer, most likely somebody else does. In fact, most likely we all do. And I think this is a really important, uh, really important thing to grapple with, uh, especially for, for college students. I think oftentimes when, you know, I remember when I was in college, I thought about what I wanted to do for the good of the world and how I could benefit those around me. And given the mission of this college and your predisposition, I think you guys wrap, you know, think about these questions as well. And I would say that's amazing. Continue to do so. And don't forget to think about your own happiness. Because if each individual only thinks about the happiness of those around them to the detriment of themselves, then all of us end up unhappy. So remember to work to decrease the suffering of those around you, but also make yourself happy. This is an extremely important point to me. Um, so at the end, I think we're left with a universal min-max problem. <laughs> As Lao Tzu might say, it's the most simple idea and the hardest to attain. We just need to work to have a maximum amount of joy and pleasure and appreciation and understanding of this amazing world that we live in. And at the same time, work to decrease and minimize the amount of suffering from those around us. Thanks very much. I think we're going to be uh, taking some questions uh, first and as I just sort of get the ball rolling here and then pretty soon we're going to be welcoming all of you to chime in with any questions that you might have, um, either through texting them indirectly or coming and directly speaking into the microphone. Okay, But I'm going to just start us off with uh, a question for both uh, professors here. Thank you, first of all, for your um, succinct uh, but at the same time thorough presentation of your worldviews. I just want to start with a question about any sort of myths or perceptions you might have that you feel you need to correct or um, some kinds of misunderstandings you feel that people who are outside of your worldview might have and therefore you would like to take this opportunity to either address or maybe even correct some of those things. Do you want me to go? Yeah, sure. Like to go sure. First? Yeah. Um, yeah, there's, there's lots of things. But one of the things that's uh, sort of exciting to me that I found uh, really beautiful that I would encourage you guys to think about is, um, is just about the Bible itself. You know, it, it's so, um, what's the right way of saying this thing? It is an incredibly complicated piece of work that is difficult to read through the eyes of 21st century Americans. Because when you try to read it, as a math book, right? Genesis 1, well, God made man at the sixth day. Genesis 2, God made man first. Contradiction, right? And that's the right way to read it if you're reading it as that text. But it's, it's a beautiful, complicated text, amazing works of literature. And, um, and what it does is it doesn't, to me, partly kind of to comment on what Dagan was saying at the end, it doesn't give you a moral landscape, like here are the good things that Jesus wants you to do, but it tells you a story as to how everything should be seen. So it's not that Jesus came and told us good things, it's just the fact that he's the last of a piece of puzzle of how God has been working to bring this world back to himself again. So it's not an easy text, it's been written for thousands of years by lots of different authors. So my encouragement is it's gonna be messy, but think about it that way. I guess I would say to the public at large, to remember that goodness has many sources. So I think a, a common refrain is that somebody is a good church-going individual. I'll see this in the news here at in police reports. Somebody was a victim of, uh, of a crime. They were an innocent bystander. And they'll be described as a good church-going individual. Mm -hmm. As somehow that tagline is much more meaningful than simply a good individual, or say he was a good individual that never went to church. I don't think I'd ever read that. <laughs> no. 
innocent guy run down on Foothill Boulevard. He was a great guy, never went to church. I don't think, <laughs> I don't think I'd read it. And in, in fact, some ways I feel as though it should be the opposite. And, and what I mean by that is, if, if somebody is nice to me only because they want to go to heaven, then it doesn't matter to me if that vision of heaven is a harem with 20 virgins or a white puffy cloud where you shake your grandfather's hand if they're only being kind to me because of self-interest, then it's not meaningful to me. Of course, one can certainly be both religious and kind. This is, I'm not going in that direction, but what I'm saying is if somebody is kind to me because they're aware of the human condition and that others might suffer and that they themselves enjoy it when others are kind, to me that's something that is really meaningful if they have sympathy and empathy. Um, so I think that uh, for the, for the for the maybe world at large, it's good to remember that uh, kindness and good-heartedness don't stem only uh, from uh, a religious background. Absolutely. Yeah, one other thing I've noticed in both of your uh, kind of presentations is there is this perspective that those others, there are more of the other perspective. So for example, it seems like science is taking over almost to the extreme. On one hand, it seems like there's very little respect for either, whether it be religious worldviews or just belief in the supernatural. And at the same time, there seems to be the sense we're kind of devolving, where sort of seems like religious views are too given too much credit. So I'm sort of hearing both sides, and I'm trying to balance that. And I'm wondering, to what extent does that view of sort of being the underdog in some ways uh, reflect in your uh, daily choices or your daily decision making or you know how you choose to do certain things about your life so basically how does your worldview then of those kinds of worldviews affect some of your you know day-to-day -day choices Should we start with you this time? sure um, it's interesting I, I guess I don't think about the relationship between science and religion daily so it doesn't directly affect my daily decisions, but all of this stuff that we're talking about, uh, my belief system certainly does. And, and maybe I'm unconscious about the way it affects my life. So I'm, my background is that I'm a Russian Jew. Uh, so like all of my parents and grandparents going all the way back, they were Russian Jews. And the reason that my family came to this country is because there was persecution of Jewish people and they left the Iron Curtain. And uh, you know, a member of my family was killed in the pogroms and things were getting bad and they just came to the United States in around the 20s. Um, and so my parents were academics and basically atheists. They practiced the Jewish cultural traditions but didn't believe in God. Um, and so I'm sure that you know, impacts me uh, and I'm sure it affects my worldview. But I tend not to think about that consciously uh, in a daily way. But I, I certainly do think about issues regarded to suffering and social justice. So I mean, I view working to make society a better place as something just because I would like there to be less suffering in the world. Um, and so I think about that, and it really impacts uh, my everyday life and my, my career. I, I, a significant portion of my career is outreach and working to broaden participation. Because I happen to think that one of the best ways to decrease suffering in the world is to increase the number of people that are involved in mathematics. <laughs> Save the world through math, right? Okay. That's a, yeah, that's a difficult question. Uh, I think I do agree with Dagan in the sense that this is not sort of a day-to-day -day thing. Right? Um, but there are a couple of things that I guess would kind of unnerve me. One of, one of it is sort of the point you hit about the religious right, you know, is, um, yeah, especially the Christian right or something like that is the right way of saying it. It's, um, I think the thing that unnerves me is sort of where politics and religion meet and what it has been painted at. So a lot of people, when they think about the Christian faith, they say, oh, you must be Republican, or whatever, right? whatever that would be. And it's a kind of a dangerous place to go. I mean, if anything, the person, if you look at sort of the Christian faith, even what Jesus says, the people he picked on, kind of pushed the most, were actually the people who were religious. Jesus never looked at those who are the poor, those who are the oppressed. He actually looked at the Pharisees and the teachers of the law and says, look, you're abusing your power, right? It's this abuse of power that's dangerous. But 
On the other hand, you know, as somebody who was trying to, just recently, just a few years ago, I became a US citizen. I was, I was born and raised in India, grew up there. And then uh, I was an Indian citizen all my life, almost in the States, but I didn't want to give up that citizenship because it was a gift given to me. So I wanted to take it seriously when I became a US citizen. And it was great being an Indian citizen because I wasn't responsible for anything that happened here. I could just be like, yeah, it's your country, right? So, uh, <laughs> but the moment I swore, right, allegiance and I became a US citizen, all of a sudden, right, it's, it's now I'm accountable. So the, the concept of where does religion meet, uh, meet law? Right? There's a difference between what is good and what is true, maybe to what I think is right, versus the law to say that it's something that should be imposed on others. That's a complicated and not an easy place to be. But, uh, but my struggle is, is to make it clear of uh, what the Christian faith should be about, is not to abuse the concept of religion and to push it on others. But on the other hand, you have to be careful because if you see people who are bad parents, and they're abusing their power as parents, that doesn't mean we should abolish parenthood. Right? So every one of us abuses things for, as, math, as a professor, you can abuse somebody. As a student, you, could, you can abuse your right as a student or even as a son or daughter. So uh, that doesn't give us the right to throw the baby away with the bathwater. But it should be something to take into consideration. Um, one last question, and then I'll open it up to the rest of the audience. Um, both of you are, have seemed to have common ground on sort of this um, addressing the issue of suffering. Mm. Do you don't think it's good, or you think it should be addressed, or um, yes. there's a desire for less suffering? Yeah, uh, yeah. You kind of phrased it as, you know, desire for justice. Mm -hmm. That's why when we watch these movies, we want retribution. Or you mentioned, you know, seek pleasure and minimize suffering, right? So I find that to be a common uh, point for both of you. Is there ever a time um, when suffering is useful or helpful or even good? I or mean, not really. Yeah, I've, every test I give, right? So it's, <laughs> it's awesome. I mean, the goal, for, I mean, you come to my class, the goal is to make me cry, right? It's just, you just want, it's, the analogy I give is, uh, is something, I mean, let me say this in a superficial way, but there's a difference between your coach teaching you how to do a push-up and you watch him do a push-up, right? Versus you actually doing the push-up. Because you can take notes all you want on the art of push-upping, right? And then you have to do one, right? So there's that difference in that, the concept of pain breaks you and changes your character. So I think that's important to us. But, uh, but to me, the biggest thing about suffering and about justice is this bigger word that you mentioned, is that I find it really hard to talk about, talk about reconciliation and peace and inviting other people in without addressing evil. I find that really hard to say that, you know what, we're all, look, I'm here to do good for everyone. I find that really hard when I know of brutal evilness in the world through people I've talked to, through people I've seen. So whatever it is, I need evil to be defined and to be dealt with before I can talk about reconciliation. I don't mind forgiving another person as long as the person admits that they were the one in the wrong. Right? So somehow, the concept of justice and evil is wrapped up in doing good to others to me. That's really important. We can open it up now to uh, the audience for questions. You can either um, text them or, or we have one mic up here in the front that you're welcome to come to as well. So any questions, feel free to come forward. Yes. Um, yeah, I'm not sure if it's on. Yeah. Um, I'll rephrase it when you're done. Yeah. Yeah. Um, okay. But then later in the talk, you were talking about that caused by um, like the separation between God and the world. Yes. That seems like a huge conflict between saying that, like, okay, the separation of God and the world is the cause of all these good things in life. So I'm assuming I misunderstood you. Yes. No. That's completely my fault. So uh, that's really good for catching that. Uh, so when I'm. This is good. When I, uh, when I was talking about messiness, you're, let me just rephrase that thing. She's saying in one part I was talking about messiness as something that was the bad thing. In the other part I was talking about messiness as if something that was the good thing. 
And my point about messiness is the fact that those are the things that it's really hard for science to answer. Those are the kind of big questions that it's really hard to get across through scientific means. So you're right if I use that word technically, that they are two different things. But I meant big ideas. Right? That's what I meant by the concept of messiness. Things that are too big to handle, whether it's good things about messiness that we can't understand, or the painful things about justice that are also hard to understand. And maybe it's worth pointing out that we agree on so much of this. So in particular, there are questions that are complicated and things that are certainly outside of scientific knowledge. And I think it's important uh, to investigate those. And to me, that is, demonstrates the important of thing, importance of things like all of the other subjects that one might study in college. <laughs> art and history and literature. Those are other ways of examining the world around us. So I see the need to examine these big questions. I don't see the need for religious explanations uh, as answers, though. So we, we agree on the need for investigation, but perhaps not on what the, where the answer might come from. I don't know. But uh, can I just? Yeah, please. Um, so one of the things is you were saying something about there are these lots of beautiful ideas in all religions, right? Definitely agree. Like the concept of doing good and morality isn't tied somehow uniquely to the Christian faith, right? Um, yeah, the concept of these things are, and there are beautiful ideas in all these religions, I agree. But, but at the same time, each religion is somehow claiming to talk about the truth, right? with a capital T, right? With reality with a capital R. So it's like saying that there are these beautiful math ideas, but there are some that are wrong. It's like, well, that's a great idea, dude. Unfortunately, that doesn't work. Right. So where do you draw the line between kind of taking an idea and saying there are beautiful things in these religions, but at the same time, they literally are in conflict with one another. The Christian faith is actually saying things that are very different than Hinduism, which is actually saying things different than Buddhism about what reality is about. So where do you... So, there, so there's two things that come up there. Um, first is I'm, I'm glad that you caught that because that was something of my point uh, mm -hmm. with... Uh, this little proof of the irrational. I, I can't see conflicting truths with the capital T existing in our universe. It just doesn't work that way. I see. I so see. one does have to make some kind of choice if one sees these mutually exclusive options. Um, so it's certainly the case. And that's part of the reason why none of them are appealing to me, mm. that they seem in some ways equally good or bad. Mm. No offense at all, but yeah. the uh, Christian ideas seem just as ridiculous or not ridiculous sure. as the Greek gods. They're both awesome and not awesome, depending on one's perspective. Uh, and so, so there's certainly a conflict there, and I couldn't subscribe to both. On the other hand, I think this is similar to your baby and bathwater comment. So just because I might not believe that there is a Christian God and that Jesus is the Son of God and so forth, or however that works, yeah. um, that doesn't mean that there aren't amazing and beautiful lessons to be learned. So similar, like this quote you know, from the Dalai Lama, I happen to not believe in reincarnation, but that doesn't mean that I don't find things that are uh, arguments that are made beautiful and persuasive. Uh, so just because I don't have a belief in the religion doesn't mean that all of the amazing culture mm -hmm. and beautiful ideas that have come from that need to be discarded or disdained. But you are doing some filtering, right? Remember that the beautiful analogy you talked about the water and how it put, but you could actually use that to come up with another like dangerous analogy, like water is the one that makes your hair or whatever, you know, like, and then it's like, that's why you should use, I don't know, head and shoulders, I'm just making up stuff. But, uh, <laughs> I mean, so what you're actually making a judgment claim somehow internally, and you're saying, you know what, this truth I accept, but that Absolutely. I reject. And, and that is somehow so important. I think when people advocate for science, they're really touching on what you're talking about here, which is the idea that we all have to keep our wits about us, mm -hmm. that we can't be told by somebody else what to believe, how to believe, that we need as individuals to think carefully and critically so that we can accept statements yeah. as being true or not. I, I think that's really the heart of it. Would you say that you are a religious person? I mean, meaning that you're actually making these choices personally to, to live your life? I mean, there's a framework in which you're viewing? I, I can't see how to get myself described as religious in any accurate way. Okay. But, uh, but maybe spiritual? 
I see. Um, in the same way that I don't believe or really disbelieve in you know these pantheons of gods, I don't really believe or disbelieve in superstitious things. Like maybe it, we are luckier if we throw salt over our shoulders. Or maybe we are luckier if you punch the roof of your car when you're going through a yellow light. <laughs> you know? <laughs> Did you guys know that one? I've never heard that before. <laughs> you know, there's... <laughs> I don't know. I, I can't disprove these things. It's, this world is amazing and rich and beautiful, and there is so much that I don't know about it. That's the one thing I'm really confident about, the small amount I know I see. about our universe. Great. Yeah, come up to the mic. And... <laughs> you guys should just make a line if yeah, you want to. Oh, feel free to make a line. Um, I'm sorry, I can't remember your names. Science guy? <laughs> whoa, 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 let's just take it easy here. I'm sorry, everyone loves, I'm sorry, that was, I'm not trying to draw lines, that was kind of supposed to be a joke, but. Uh, okay, so, uh, I, do have a, I do have a question for you. Um, Professor Carp, my name is Dagan, by the way. Dagan, okay. So, uh, in, your, in your talk, which I think we would all agree with, you pointed out some of the negative aspects of uh, negative historical aspects of religion. And some positives. Yeah, and some positives. Um, I, I would be curious to hear your argument for uh, science being better for the world in terms of getting us closer to answering questions of, of happiness. Like, why, why aren't we happy? Like, I, I think you could argue that there have been some scientific advancements that have been detrimental to the world. Um, the the H bomb might be the like most famous example, but there are definitely others. And so I I I, I don't disagree with you, but I'm just wondering if you could like bring that point further out. Why why you think science has been better at answering these questions, or if you even think it has? I I, I don't. So I <laughs> so I'm I'm glad I didn't make that point because I don't think that I would agree with it. Science is, I view as somehow neutral. You, just because we have the ability to design and drop an H-bomb does not mean that we need to. So I, somehow that's tied into science, but I mean, uh, you know, I have a bottle of water that I could throw in a violent way at Satyan, but <laughs> I won't do so. <laughs> And if I did, I don't think that we would argue against the, you know, technologies and polymer studies and so forth that went into, you know, making these beautiful bottles of water. So somehow, it's, it, to me, there's, science can be used for both good and bad. Mm -hmm. And, you know, w as an alternative, it's, it's not an either or. Science and religion, there are a tremendous number of scientists and mathematicians who have very deep faiths, many of whom are in this room tonight, and I respect them greatly. One can walk down with science and religion hand in hand. There's no contradiction. And neither one is better or worse for the world in some global happiness sense. Cool. Thanks. Um, I'm glad he asked the question that he did because it makes my question a great follow-up. Um, it's just it seems like a lot of what you were talking about had to do with what's good, what like will provide meaning, um, mm. and um, you were describing science as a little bit more of like a sterile truth mm -hmm. and um, something that's kind of exists, like science is, and you can use it for good or bad, mm -hmm. but it exists like independent of those labels. And so I guess my question is, how much does the truth matter? How much does you know, science, like, if we come up with uncomfortable truths through the scientific method, does that count for something? If we come up with these understandings of reality that challenge some other understanding of reality in a really fundamental way, and we have to grapple with those, if they come into conflict in questions of good or bad, but one of them also has this architecture of truth to it in a way that the other one doesn't or has differently, like, does that matter? Yeah, I, I understand. I, it wasn't to me, right? It's, it's to both of you. Okay. I'd like both of you. Yeah. I, I agree with Dagan in the sense that science is a tool, right? It's, a, it's tools we're using to learn the world better, right? How we were here, what happened, what's going to happen, how little things work, how big things work. 
And if anything like that does really challenge, right, seriously challenge my faith, then I have to reevaluate it. So far, nothing has happened that has made me challenge that at all. I mean, I don't, I don't even see a little bit of this going on, right, for me to do that. There, I'll tell you what would be challenging, right, to me. One of my core beliefs, I think this is what the Christian faith is founded on, is the resurrection, that Jesus, this guy who died, nobody would really argue that this guy lived, nobody would really argue this guy died. But to come back as a bodily person, right, and then for people to say, oh, we saw him resurrect, you know, it's this person. To say that that didn't happen, like historically, we can sort of nail down, right? Let's pretend we build a time machine and do this thing. Then my faith will be sh shaken to the core. Like that's a huge thing, right? But the, one of the big contradictions, especially as you talk about science, is that the reason we think there's a contradiction between the science and the Christian faith is usually because we're reading the Bible in a very 21st century way. We're reading it as a scientific document. That, that makes it a messy thing. In other words, so the right question is, how do you read it? And how do you read different parts of it? And, it's not easy. So, and theologians and scholars have struggled and continue to struggle with it. But you're right. That is, you always need to keep those things in check. Absolutely. So to, to briefly touch on that, I would say that I, I, there's an interesting debate. Is mathematics created or discovered? That touches on this question of is science and math just there, true, out there. To me, that question is irrelevant. I think that mathematics is a totally human endeavor. Whether we are discovering these things, it's us discovering them. Mm. And we know much more about ourselves by what we in our slow and prodding way are able to discover in this infinite world of mathematics. It tells us much more about us than the universe. And on the other hand, if we're creating mathematics, of course, certainly then it's a human activity. So either way, discovering mathematical truths is a very human thing. Mm. And whether or not that can be good or bad is only how we use it. So if we use our knowledge of mathematics and science to reduce suffering, then that's a good thing. If we use it otherwise, then that doesn't seem so good. Okay. Thank you both. Thank you. I'm going to chime in just real quickly with a question that came texted in. And I'm going to sort of preface it by saying that it seems both when you look at religion and both when you look at science, there is this sense that it's sort of value neutral, meaning it can be used for good and it can be used for evil. And it has been, as a matter of fact, in both cases. I think even the question we just received about science, you, I could conceive of science saying that certain races of people are biologically superior. In fact, these studies have come out over time, right? And but I think there would be some sort of moral sensibility or some sort of ethical reaction to that to say, you know, we can't accept that kind of science, right? We can't accept that as a sort of uh, kind of a new standard by which then we judge our, you know, actions and legislation or whatever. So this kind of leads to the question of how do you define uh, morals? How do you define whether religion is being used positively or negatively? Or how do you define when science, I mean, you did already say that Science can be used for good or evil. So how do you decide that? How do you, def you know, decide for religion or for science? And so kind of going to the question of how do you define good and evil uses of religion and science? Uh, so f for me, this always goes back to the central belief that suffering is the only measure by which we can do good or bad. As far as I can tell, in the big scope of the universe, if the Earth and all life on it disappeared, that would be neither positive nor negative. That's just the nature of the universe. Asteroid comes, asteroid goes, goodbye everyone. Uh, <laughs> while we're all here, it seems as though we know that we can suffer, and that feels bad. I don't know what is after this life or what happened before it, but I do know that I've experienced suffering, and by analogy, I'm guessing that all of these other living beings have suffering as well. So for me, the only universal moral code is to decrease the suffering of any being that we think might be capable of experiencing suffering. And all measures of good and evil are measured on that axis. Or otherwise, I don't know how to measure it. I think there's, uh, when you talk about religion and, and science and what it can tell us, I think there's a big gap between knowing what is good versus doing the good. 
I think we can take ethics classes and say, you know, this is what this religion says. If you take the sum of all the good religions, here's what it means to know what's good. There's a big gap, my friends, between that versus you actually doing something that you can, you can be empowered to do. And to me, my quest for truth is which framework, which way of viewing the world empowers us the most in doing the good. Okay, we'll take a question at the microphone next. Uh, no, not at the mic yet. All right. Um, so I guess this is kind of for both of you. And it actually was good that you brought up morals, because that's actually what my question was on. So nice. Um, so I guess um, I think we can agree that a law of some kind needs a lawgiver. So um, I guess my question is, wouldn't or statement wouldn't wouldn't it make sense? for um, a moral law to have a moral lawgiver, or I guess I'm just opening up the stage for discussion on that. Want to go for that one? I don't know. I'm trying to think. That... OK, so I, I guess my quick response would be that I disagree with the first part of the supposition, that a law needs a single lawgiver. It seems like things work best when we decide things together. I like the democratic idea of deciding on laws as a group. To me, I don't think I find, I'm not convinced of the Christian faith because I see moral laws. I certainly do see moral laws out there. Like part of it is uh, to show kindness, to show forgiveness, to lay down your life. You know, these are bigger attributes that we would say for example, Mother Teresa, MLK, all these guys you put up, they sort of share these big picture things, giving up who they are for the sake of others. But to say that that's why I say there has to be a God, that's not, that doesn't convince me. That could be a part of it. That could be like a really small part of it. So at the end, when I add it, when I integrate over the whole thing, I'm, I, I'm one over, just to notify that, right? I'm one over. So, but that isn't enough for me to, to say that thing. Thanks. Thanks, thanks. Okay, I think we have a couple more people in line to ask questions, so I'm going to have you come. Initial question actually kind of was a little bit talked about, but more so on because so much has been talked about about good, um, we never really defined good, which kind of leads to faulty arguments. So, is there a definition that both of you could give for the concept of good? Um, because it leads everyone to a bunch of assumptions from their own previous histories. Gosh, it's, to me, that's tough. But I, I mean, to me, I go back to scripture, right? The reason I believe certain things are good is because I'm convinced because of other reasons that there's a God who has shown himself to the world this way, that he's real because of these evidences that we've seen. And I agree very much with Dagan that we know so little about the big, right? So how are we possibly, who are we to say we now know God? That's like a bold, arrogant statement to make. And I agree with him 100%. The only way I would even be willing to make that statement is if God himself comes down and shows himself to us. That's the only reason. So because of that belief, I'm going back and saying, I believe what is good because of what he has shown. Because, because God came down and showed it to us. Well, that we, what I mean by that is said. the reason why I believe, the reason I can define what good is through what is, you know, through the characteristics of what God has shown, through scripture and all these things, is, uh, is because of other evidences that I have. Does, does that make sense? Absolutely. Okay. I'll, I'll just start talking about suffering again. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Oh, while well, some of you are coming down to ask questions, if you can sit kind of down here so we don't have so much lag time, I'm going to ask one more question that was texted in. It's actually to Professor Davidos. Um, isn't Christianity just an escape mechanism, especially when it comes to uh, rewards in heaven? Uh, the now seems so important. So I, I, reinterpreting this question a little bit more, you know, what are the benefits of Christianity now if really if the idea of religious reward is in, always in the future? 
I, I don't think, I mean, I think the notion of heaven is really dangerous. To me, the, the classical Christian faith of heaven is not we die, we float away in souls and hang out somewhere, right? That's, uh, that's, very, that's a very Greek notion. The notion of heaven, what a taste, I don't even like to call it heaven. I'd like to think of it as the new heaven and the new earth, the new earth that'll be there. A taste of it is what Jesus did after he came back from the dead. He displayed a taste of the future. He brought back ice cream from the future, right? That's the best way to think of it. And, wh and whatever you could look at the characteristics of the resurrected Christ, you will see characteristics of the future. So to me, it's not a ghost. The fact that he had flesh and blood is important. One of the things he said is, let's have fish and bread. Let's eat. Eating is important. All these things are important. And the goal of us as believers, as followers of Christ, is to bring forth that kingdom, meaning to take care of the planet, to show love and kindness to one another, to bring about what you want the earth to be. That is the new earth and the new kingdom that we're looking forward to. To me, that's heaven. I can't imagine heaven without ice cream. I mean, dude, seriously. Right? I can't imagine heaven without math. And all of these things, the joys that you have will be here. That's what heaven's about. That's why we do um, I have a comment and a question. The comment is, Prof Karp, I think you're wearing hamburger shoes and that's awesome. <laughs> you haven't seen the french fries. <laughs> <laughs> They're either hamburger shoes or zombie shoes. I couldn't make up my mind. But um, my question was, how does your specific field bring to bear on your moral life? Sorry, specific field Your studies. Math. You're doing math. Yes. Oh. Yes. yes. <laughs> I, I thought you said your, your feel. And I was trying to figure out how to answer that. So how does, how does working in mathematics affect my life? Oh, my morals. I'll get it one of these times. One of them. You know, to me, it's, um, I don't think the math itself is related to my faith directly, right? In terms of uh, me proving a result, all of a sudden I, you know, I now can understand Christ better. I don't, there's nothing like that. But I'll tell you the way I approach math is related to my faith. And to me, I love integrating different pieces of math to outside of it. So one of the things I love doing is thinking about like designs and origami, how we can think about all ways of folding and unfolding something, or related to things in genetics, spaces of evolutionary trees, or you know, these ideas that are particle collisions, moduli spaces, the stuff we cared about, Dagan and I. All of these things are taking math sort of outside of its context and plugging into physics, into art, into biology. And I really, when I do say I want to eliminate the walls between these dualistic notions, I really feel that way in my own approach to math that I want to give math and eliminate the walls between math and anything else. So the way I approach it is different, but not, uh, but not math itself. I, I think the way it affects me is, right, in mathematics, a tremendous amount is by design always left to the reader. So you're not really supposed to believe very much mathematics that you don't think you could prove for yourself. You have to take some theorems for granted because you just don't have enough time to prove every theorem that you use. But you should feel that you could, if need be, prove that theorem, read and understand a proof of that theorem. So it makes, I think part of that makes me um, inclined to have a desire to think very critically and to not believe things that other people tell me without questioning them carefully. So it's possible that my lack of religious faith is just because I can't find a way to convince myself that it's true, and I find other people's arguments unconvincing. So I think I, I try to accept information as true through a, a, a very fine sieve in my mind. I try not to have too many things enter my mind and believe them as true uh, unless I think that I have some reason to actually believe that they're true. Okay, I'm going to ask one more question, and then I'm going to have, probably have time for two more. So if you the last two want to come down and get ready for that. Um, this question was texted in, um, both one to here and one to here. So first I'll ask, um, what is the most difficult part of Christianity to swallow? What is the most difficult part about Christianity? And the second one is, what is the most tempting thing that Christianity has to offer, if anything? 
Gosh, yeah. To me, uh, the reason it's hard about the Christian, I'll tell you my struggles with the Christian faith, this is issues with culture, right? We are at a certain time in the world, 21st century, we're Americans, we see things in a certain way. But the Bible makes certain truths with a capital T, like this is absolutely true. And somebody who's in this culture, the reason I have issues with scripture sometimes is because I don't, I don't agree with it all the time. And the fact that I don't agree with it all the time actually, in a weird way, makes me happy. And I'll tell you why. Because if I agree with 100% of what was written, this old document, all the time, then either I'm reading it so that it says exactly what I want it to say, or magically, the Lord of the universe has spoken exactly to this time period alone. And the fact that there's this tension means that there's probably something bigger out there that I'm probably not molded in the shape of, that it's pushing me to change and make me think about things differently rather than the way the culture is pushing me. So there's this tension out there. It's difficult for me to, to sort of drink all of the truths of the Christian faith straight up. And, uh, and it's encouraging, but at the same time, difficult. It's, it, it's an interesting and difficult question. I don't know what is the most tempting aspect of Christianity. My knee-jerk reaction is that I'm, I'm not very tempted by it. But on the other hand, there are, there's so much beautiful history and culture wrapped up in Christianity that I think certainly would be cool to just know more about that. Mm -hmm. I find the community tempting, or maybe I find the idea of the community mm -hmm. tempting. Mm -hmm. I think it would be cool if there was a bunch of like-minded people, meaning they thought kind of just like I did, and we went and hung out on Sunday mornings <laughs> and talked about cool stuff that was important and had a community that way. Mm -hmm. um, so maybe, maybe some combination of, of, of culture and community I find really appealing. We'll take our last two questions here from our audience. Uh, it's okay. um, so I'm not, I'm not sure if I am a Christian right now because like, that is like, it's caused by a lot of doubts that I have right now. So when I was, when I was younger, when I was six, I was, in, I was in America for the first time. And then my mother brought me to church, and then I became a Christian because I listened to this kind of lecture, and, and I was very tempted by the idea of heaven. I was like, it's kind of this bright space where you can have fun and live forever, which sounded very tempting. But, but like, as I, as I became older, I felt like, just as the last question, I found many parts of Christian, uh, Christianity very hard to swallow. Like, it, it became very, it became like the source of many of my doubts. For example, um, I think I, t I agree with Prof. Karp about what he talks about. Like there's so many, there's so many religions in the world, and like I found many of them very appealing. And it's it's hard for me to just fix my mind on one of these religions and then def then denying my experience with other religions. It's kind of narrowing my experience with the world, and that's something that is not very attractive for me, or that's something that very, that I feel bad about. And another doubt that I have about Christianity is that is from my own experience with the Christian um, community. Uh, so um, after I was in America, I went back to China, and then my mother also took me to church in China, and I sometimes go with her. I felt the community pretty, pretty engaging, but there was a lot of problems that I saw. Like, I, I see a lot of people, and I feel that they're believing in God basically because that they want to have, they want to get personal benefits or personal interests. They're talking about, they're worshiping God in church, but then after that, they, all they talk about is that how believing in God can get my kid into a better high school. And they talk about all sorts of these things, which makes, which makes religion less appealing to me. And I always saw, and, and I am, I am all, another point that I am very, I'm very like doesn't appeal to me is that I found that a lot of, I found that a lot of Christians really would like to spread their ideas. They're very keen on spreading their ideas to other people. But then, in, at least in China, I found that many people do that in very absurd ways. I would think brochures who wrote who wrote that who wrote that there was this British guy who interviewed both Einstein and Newton, and they were all Christians. That was like it was very it was. 
obviously not true. And it, I found that very, very yeah, hard to swallow. Like, I would like to know, like, how, how do other Christians or a Christian like a very highly educated Christian like you deal with these problems? I see. Um, <laughs> <laughs> let's see. You know, the fact that, let me just say something really, uh, two little things. The fact that you are thinking seriously about other religions, I applaud that. I mean, check it out. If I really claim that there's this one truth, that Gauss-Bonnet really is true, check out other theorems, man. See if they work out. Check out other things. I'm, I'm, I'm going to put my weight that Gauss-Bonnet is going to work out. So I encourage you to do that. Um, the second thing is I also encourage you to be careful on how you're thinking about it. So what I mean by that is if you really believe that all religions have some truth in them and nothing can ever be right, that is a pretty powerful religious statement you're making. It means you're saying that you know the truth about every religion, that you can actually look back and see the whole landscape of religions, and you can actually say, oh, that has some truth, and that has some truth, but nothing really has all of it. That's a religious statement you're saying about every religion itself. So there's nothing wrong with that. I'm just saying, just understand that is a powerful statement that you want to make. So, but I do encourage you to think about other things, absolutely. Thank you. Thank you. OK, I think we have time for one last question. All right, not to beat a dead horse, my question is also about good and evil. Um, <laughs> Carp, you, uh, or, or Professor Carp, you earlier. <laughs> excuse me. Uh, sorry. Uh, you earlier um, introduced a um, hypothetical where if a meteor was hurtling towards Earth and all humankind were to be exterminated by it, um, that would be it. And it wouldn't be evil, it would just be a thing. Um, but a counter hypothetical would be if humankind had a way to stop the meteor, but it inevitably would uh, kill many, many people and cause a great deal of suffering. Is it evil or heroic to stop that meteor? And really, this actually leads to a bigger question. What is weakness? Is it weak to cause suffering, suffering or is it weak to let to let it happen. And like, so if you're a general and a, politi and a politician says, here's a war I want you to fight, are you a weak general if you resign and say, I don't want to fight? So I, when I was a first year undergraduate student at Tulane University, I was in a, 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 a writing class, kind of like our, our first writing class here. And we were asked to entertain one of these stories, I, it was something, we were in a canoe and there was, you know, a doctor and a lawyer and we had to decide who this, I decided at that point in my life that that was the right time to stop entertaining strange hypotheticals. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I want to get at maybe what you're driving at, which is, you know, this notion of good and evil and weakness and I, don't know what weakness is in this sense. Um, I, I don't. I don't really know how to how to measure weakness. How to think of something being more. I mean, it's a relative term, right? It's weaker than other and strength. I don't know what the strength weakness spectrum is. I don't know if that's a something that is linear and well ordered, or if there are many dimensions, right? So I don't know how to think about the space of weak and strong, and and how to declare something strong or not. It's, it's an interesting thing to consider, but I, I just don't know how to get at that kind of information. Cool. I was just going to ask both of you, if you don't mind making some last closing remarks before we have to end our time together. And um, maybe we'll have you first. Sure. Yeah. Um, there's a, I just wanted to tell you a little cool story that I, that I love to close with. Um, there's a, there's a theologian, probably one of the greatest theologians in the past century. His name is Karl Barth. Superstar, just has absorbed the scriptures, the Christian faith, sort of the Jewish ideas of what's going on about it. God has poured his entire life into it. People come all over to Europe to, to have studied with him. And uh, he was coming out one day from a, from a building, and this famous astronomer comes up to him, and he says, Professor Barth, isn't it true that all religions can just be whittled down into one phrase. And he goes, 
my friend, what, what phrase is this? That every religion, these great thoughts that people have had, the Christian faith personally that I'm struggling with, what is this phrase? He goes, well, do unto others as you just have them do unto you. Isn't that sort of the point of the Christian faith or religion itself? Karl Bach thought about this for a little bit. And he said, my friend, he turned to this astronomer, he said, well, isn't it true that all of astronomy can also be whittled down to a phrase? Guy goes, are you kidding me? The curvature of space and time black holes, relativity, dark matter. What is this phrase that all of astronomy can be whittled down into? He said, twinkle, twinkle, little star. <laughs> and the point is that, you know, you could say these kind of catchphrases. Dude, isn't all religion the same? Aren't you all trying to say this thing? Because there's so much depth to these things that I encourage you to pursue it. Roll up your sleeves, get messy about these things, and, and think seriously about it. I just want to thank everyone for showing up uh, and for engaging in this discussion. Right now is such a tumultuous period. Look at what's happening in Kiev mm -hmm. and in uh, Venezuela. It's a, there's a lot of terrible things happening and a lot of people that find it difficult to get along. So I think it's really fun that people with different viewpoints can get together on an evening and take time to talk Absolutely. about these big ideas. So I just want to thank everyone for showing up. Absolutely. Let's thank our speakers. For more information about the Veritas Forum, including additional recordings and a calendar of upcoming events, please visit our website at veritas.org.